what I'm kind of going to present to you today, the first sort of third will be sort of the, the analytical framework that's in the working paper that I've, I've left for you. So some of what I'm going to talk about is, is there, so you can go away and kind of read up and, and pull that up to pieces if you don't actually in the next hour. Um, and then the second third, I'm going to talk about these three problems, infrastructure, intention and experience, which again are kind of big, big conceptual issues, which are things that have, we've run into when we've been talking to sort of public diplomacy practitioners, when they've been trying to, you know, get their strategic narratives out there in the world. Um, how to deal with changing infrastructure, how to uh, maintain the kind of intention between, behind the narrative and not lose control of it, and trying to cultivate certain experiences through your narratives, get people to actually believe that they're living the narrative that you want them to believe in, in their country or in the world order. So that's, that's kind of how the, the plan for today's talk is. And what, where, where this strategic narrative agenda comes from was we did a, a working group for the International Studies Association in 2009 where we got together a load of people from communication studies and foreign policy and public diplomacy, these kind of three areas, of, and tried to get them to have conversations, because they were all studying the same thing, particularly international communication. But they, weren't, they were talking past each other, and they weren't aware of each other's models, and, and there was a potential there for collaboration. So we've been doing various events since 2009. Uh, which is culminating in a, in a book that um, will be coming together this summer, where we've kind of got people from these different fields who will talk about strategic narratives and try and actually put this agenda into practice through some really good cases. Um, and we just think it's really timely. Um, and we've just been talking now about the, the next International Studies Association is on, uh, I've written it down, Power Principles and Participation in the Global Information Age. So international relations is finally saying, ah, there's something going on here that's changing the nature of the state or state interactions or whatever. And the International Communication Association, um, at their last conference, their plenary was, is communication the, the discipline of the 21st century? I do economists and psychologists and everybody else need to also be doing communication. Um, and Sonia Livingston, the head of media and communication at the LSE, uh, said of this, we often bemoan the fact that rarely do scholars from other disciplines come to us or our journals for advice on how to study the media. Rather, they seem to us to reinvent the wheel, neglect our intellectual traditions of analysis and findings and just basically tread on our toes. So, the, the, you know, there's so many easy examples to find of where people who study foreign policy have, have got an uh, undergraduate student to do a, a of this uh, content analysis in a week of the New York Times, and that represents the media, mm. media coverage of X. Um, so it's kind of coming from frustration with, you know, the, the IR people can't do that, but the media people aren't quite getting at the, 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 the interests and the dynamics that are driving why people use the media strategically in the first place. Um, I mean, we, you were talking about, we were talking about astroturfing um, in, in different African countries. The, the, um, the kind of paying people to go on the internet or phone up radio stations again and again and again. Um, well why are they doing that? It's questions of power and politics prior to how the communication occurs. So we, we're trying to get to, to bringing those things together. Now, why strategic narratives? We, we define strategic narratives, and I'd be grateful if you can... No, offer feedback on this because it's, it's an ever-evolving definition. Strate in, the, in the working paper in italics it says strategic narratives are a means for political actors to construct a shared meaning of international politics to shape the behaviour of domestic and international actors. So we've got there strategic narratives are a means like a tool. This is a very instrumental almost rational choice-ish way for political actors then to then construct, so now I'm a slightly more constructivist, construct meanings of international politics, but in all, you do that in order to change or shape behaviour. So again, it goes back to the instrumentalist, voluntarist uh, model of, of political action. Um, so why do we do this? Well, we, we think from our studies that, you know, brief observation, political leaders are constantly producing these strategic narratives. 
they might be quite event oriented or they might be narrating the, the values of their country um, but there are these, these struggles that we haven't quite got an analytical grip on yet. Um, Thomas Reeser, big international relations prof, talks about uh, narratives being shaped by leaders in order for them to un uh, overcome their domestic pressures. They can go to the international level, produce a story that enables them to kind of get beyond some of the, the things they can't really say at home. But I, I think that's slightly problematic. Um, and one of the key things we, we want to talk about is that these narratives aren't just about the state itself or the country. They're about the whole system. You're narrating the way the international order or the international system is going and the, your country's place in that. So certain countries want to say, oh yeah, we're moving to a sovereignty-based order or we're moving to a liberal order. Or There's various conceptions of the whole order which would, if everybody accepted that conception, that would be to your interest and your, your benefit in the long run. So it's, there's, there's some, some big narratives out there. Now, everybody, you know, since we, we got going, we suddenly started, you know, I've got on Google Alert, strategic narratives. Rand had a big conference on strategic narratives just before Christmas. Hmm. Um, uh, there was a, a very widely cited publication by... Um, somebody called Mr. Y, an anonymous US, uh, who knows. And Anne-Marie Slaughter, a very prominent IR professor and, and public servant now, um, she gave the preface to the book. She said, a narrative is a story. A national strategic narrative must be a story that all Americans can understand and identify with in their own lives. We seek to be the nation other nations listen to, rely on and emulate out of respect and admiration. So she's kind of dissolving into soft power by the end of that, but she's starting with strategic narrative anyway. Um, and then over here, um, the UK Ministry of Defence has started saying, in the global information environment, it's easy for competing narratives to be heard. I, not our own, other, there are other ones out there, what should we do about this? Some may be deliberately combative, our adversaries for example, or perhaps hostile media. Where our narrative meets the competing narratives, is referred to as the battle of the narratives. Although the reality is that this is an enduring competition rather than a battle with winners and losers. So, so this is you know, very trendy, I suppose, if you like. And as for the purposes of this seminar series, you might be thinking about how developing countries have their own strategic narratives, how they interact with regional hegemons and with uh, international um, players. And are there kind of are there opportunities for a large, large strategic alignment or uh, combat, as the Ministry of Defence is saying? Mm. Um, so, but what we found with looking at how the different State Departments and RAND and everybody else are, are doing their strategic narrative analysis, they don't really have a framework or a theory behind it. And this is something we, the reason we wanted to come into it was, was being able to connect kind of the projection of strategic narratives which the international relations people are quite good at explaining, with the reception and, and the interpretation and how people in their everyday lives engage with and reject or assimilate or deal with this. Um, so the, the original title of this talk was going to be on the, the conditions of effectiveness. And it, it was kind of, I was going to talk a, a, a kind of about anthropological studies that, that show how strategic narratives are used in people's everyday media consumption and stuff like that. But, I saw Marie Gillespie is coming in a couple of weeks, and, and she's kind of the, the guru on that, so um, I'm sure she'll talk about that. Now, what, why narratives and not discourse or framing or whatever else? Well, we were attracted to the, the concept because they're frameworks that allow humans to connect these unconnected phenomena around causal transformations. So it's, it's putting, we see leaders doing this, putting events into some sequence and saying, oh yeah, it's all part of the same thing. So in, in terrorism research, we talk about templates and templating. The, as soon as, oh, that looks a bit like the last thing, there must be some chain here. And then mm -hmm. it's very easy to come up with your policy response. Um, Jeffrey Roberts, the kind of historian, talks about narratives as the, just the practice of telling stories about connected sequence of action, human action. Um, Otahail talks about stories making, sense-making organisational devices. So it's about making sense between people. And the idea that a narrative is this, this thing where there's an initial order 
and then some problem comes along that disrupts the order, and then there's a set of actors that are going to put the problem right and maybe lead to the new order. It might be that that's the template for every Disney film, but we're finding that that's also the template for pretty much every policy document that we've been analysing for the last two years. Uh, like I've been writing on the Iran nuclear uh, standoff, and every IAEA report says, well, we, we had this order, but then Iran started doing this, and we didn't have the technology to monitor. So, and the, these are the actors involved, and there's China, and there's Russia, and there's Turkey, and, and Brazil. And together we must somehow come up with a, a solution, and then, but there are some good guys and bad guys. And it's, it's there in all of the, the policy analysis. Um, so we think that this is a, maybe a productive way in to explain how political actors in international politics are trying to frame and, and respond to problems. Um, now, in international relations, the, there are lots of theories about how about political change at the international level and the role of ideas in that, and there, obviously there's constructivism and post-structuralist theories of that. Um, I, in, in the last, just to give some examples, the last few weeks, uh, we went back to Robert Gilpin's uh, War and Change in International Politics, which is kind of being rediscovered at the moment. And he has this his theory of, of the last 3,000 years of international or various systems of politics that we've been through is you have some kind of equal improvement situation, then economics and technology develop in such a way that some countries suddenly start pushing ahead where others haven't quite taken advantage of those changes. So you end up with a, a, an imbalance of power where the institutions don't quite fit who's got power because um, countries are moving at different paces. So then there's this disjuncture. And then those who feel hard done by, because they've, they've risen up, but they don't have the institutional positions yet in, in the order, they challenge the order. And you get a bit of conflict. And so, you know, he wrote that in 1980, but that would be a good, you know, if you're looking at India or, or China right now. But reading through his book, he just doesn't mention communication or media or how this gets done, how countries articulate their interests during these periods of, of power transition. At one point, he mentions uh, transport and communication systems change. And then he d that's it. He doesn't look at how these, these, you know, we might talk about media ecologies, uh, completely, or have some determination over how, how these processes play out. So th this is one of the reasons I want to talk about infrastructure today, to think about how changing media infrastructures might be altering how countries do international relations which is a bit of a, a grand thing to inquire about, but I'd like to talk about that if we can. In terms of what we, finally, in terms of kind of how we conceptualise strategic narratives, um, we've kind of got a, a few points just to go through. First of all, it's, these are future-oriented claims. Um, they're about connecting, you know, narrative is connecting past, present to where you want to go in the future. Um, this is part of the way in which they have sense to us as human beings. Um, so this is why they have utility, because they're about creating an expectation or a vision about what might not come next and what is desirable to come next. Secondly, it's an identity claim. It's a way in which you can articulate what you think your country stands for. Are you one of the good guys or bad guys? Are you a victim within the story? Are you a potential person who's going to sit on the sidelines and wait? There's, there's various... Um, <coughs> ways in which you can do that. Um, Laura Rosell, one of our co-authors on the working paper, looked at the, um, the way in which uh, um, Russia and America discussed their withdrawal from Afghanistan and, and Vietnam, respectively, back, back in, the, in the 70s and 80s. And both of them had, had this superpower identity. And they didn't know how to articulate what a superpower defeat looks like. Because that's not supposed to happen. So they had to both construct a story about why it's actually, we, we, di we didn't go in for those reasons at the start. We went in for these reasons, and those reasons are okay. So it's time for us to leave now. So they were re-narrating their original story. But because they were superpowers, there were, were constraints on how they could do that. Because other countries expected them to, to perform certain uh, roles within the international system. And she found it was really interesting, although they had completely different media systems, political systems, economic systems, their story, their narration was almost identical. 
it was it was quite um, which suggests that these narratives are are quite important in international relations. Third point: um, the content of these narratives isn't fixed. The, there should be some ongoing negotiation and interaction with your domestic constituents and with other international players. Um, so again, we should expect this with developing countries as well as developed. Um, fourthly, uh, the parameters within which this interaction and, and remoulding your narrative can take place, there, there are parameters. There are certain things that Obama can't say or the other leaders can't say because of their national traditions and historical experiences. So it's not as though you can just come up with a narrative off the cuff. You've got to have, it's got to resonate domestically. Um, and then the fifth point is following from this. A strategic narrative is both for your internal and external audiences. You're, you're doing this to create domestic legitimacy and uphold your authority as well as uh, try to shape the behaviour of other actors in the international sphere. Now, they, they, the people who've written papers for us about strategic narratives for this book, they've looked at different kind of actors. Although I focus mainly on the, on the state, and I'll be talking just now, people have looked at the, the strategic narratives of NGOs, of international institutions, of terrorist groups. You could do it of multinationals. I'm sure you know, Google has a strategic narrative. Um, and within, within each of those actors, there are obviously, we can break them down even further. So, you know, within, with, how does the state you know, put out its strategic narrative? Um, one person's looking at the EU strategic narrative, and there's Cathy Ashton, who's kind of the, the head of foreign policy for the EU, but she's not the only one who says what the EU's going to do. There's also other co commissioners, and there's the, all of the people at the national level. So Europe's strategic narrative is quite muddled and it's very difficult for it to be articulated clearly. Um, so, so you can kind of, there's, there's lots of different, uh, and also the idea of citizens doing narrative work. If you can be paying your citizens $2 or $10 or $500 a day to go into chat rooms and put, keep your story alive and, and prominent and agree with it, um, then the you know, how you harness citizens and their communicative abilities and powers um, is, you know, something that states are exploring, um, which is slightly normatively troubling, perhaps. So, moving on to the kind of three problems that I, I want to bring up today, um, that are in the title. So the first one is um, changing information infrastructures. So this is kind of the, the, the technological, logistical um, set of structures, I suppose, within which communication takes place. Um, so Paul Edwards, uh, in, in the book, the edited book, Modernity and Technology, he has a great chapter on what infrastructures are, and he talks about how they become invisible over time. How, you know, obviously cutting-edge technologies or electric grids or whatever, um, seem, you know, new, but soon become forgotten. And Lisa Gittleman in her, has a book, you know, All Media or New Me Our New Media. You know, everything has been new media, and everything that's new now will be old. So, so obviously, communication infrastructures and information infrastructures are always changing. Um, and we need to, Paul Edwards talks about how actors in politics or in society need to know the infrastructure of a society in order to operate effectively in it, which is a bit of a basic point, but you know, you need to know how to catch a bus or get money out of a bank or whatever to function. So in terms of communication, we might think about how states or NGOs, how do they understand the information infrastructure around them in order to then get on and act effectively, uh, given that it seems to be changing quite a lot. Now, the context for doing strategic narratives in this changing information infrastructure seems to be a shift from a relatively ordered and institutional world of mediation and documentation of events through big broadcast media, in, in, you know, certainly in, in the West, to this more expansive, fragmented, 
live recording culture where everything is being recorded. Um, the intended and sometimes random recording of public and private events by professional media, by amateur media, and the blurring of the distinction between professional and amateur is being obviously made possible by the global portability and, and availability of these design devices. So hence you get Manuel Castells in, in his last book saying that what we have in common in global communication now isn't content, it's, it's practices, what we do with content. It doesn't matter where you are, you're recording, uploading, sharing and arguing. Um, now, the extent to which that's true, you know, it's, it's a very universal claim. Maybe we're moving towards that, but it's certainly uneven. Um, but his example was with, or oh, an example by Richard Grusin, the um, American media theorist. He talks about, in his book Pre-Mediation, about the Abu Ghraib photos. And why, he argues why they mattered wasn't because of what was in them, what was depicted. It was... He was, there was somebody, on, when it went before the American Senate Committee to, to investigate the abuses, one of the senators, they were passing the photos around, one of the senators said, what's shocking here is, last week we were passing my daughter's wedding photos around. Now we're passing these around. This is what we do, we pass photos around. This is what defines our age. And okay, it was about abuse, but there was this sudden realisation that this, this, just this spectrum of things being passed around, and it's how do you cope with a world where this is happening? This is what the, the senators, you know, another reason why they were a little bit shocked. So with, um, in, in our, the book Diffused War with Andrew Hoskins, where we look at this kind of mediatised world in terms of war and conflict, um, we argue that there's this kind of radical new potential for mediatised records of events to emerge, and we look at the concept emergence, and obviously it's its uh, tradition in the, in the natural sciences and now the social sciences, and how this emergence is affecting politics and, and conflict. Um, in particular, the way in which how media content can emerge six months or ten years after the, the event and disturb the record or the, or the received wisdom of what had actually happened. And that this seems to be happening almost systematically now, to the extent in which militaries build in a capacity to deal with that on the anticipation it will happen. There's this kind of move towards transparency and, and well, publicly moves towards transparency, where they're, they're trying to preempt leaks and preempt emergence, because emergence will happen. Um, meanwhile, audiences obviously have these, uh, these opportunities to bypass mainstream media. Um, although, that said, our ESRC project with uh, Marie Gillespie, Shifting Securities, we found that the majority of Britons, multi-ethnic, multilingual, many diasporic Britons, still turn to, to the BBC. Now that might be a, a UK specific example, but we actually found that the, com the consumption of mainstream media in this com country is actually pretty robust. Um, but there's this sense of fragmentation emergence through the new infrastructure. Um, and uh, a, a good example of that would be, you know, um, sharing our news links on Facebook. CNN had a, something out a year ago where they were saying, yeah, mo way more than 50% of our news uh, consumption comes through Facebook. So CNN old media is being renewed by new, by new media, by Facebook. So there's all of these kind of um, oscillations of new old professional amateur within this infrastructure. Um, and this is leading to new forms of gatekeeping if you're going to do strategic narrative work as, as a State Department or an NGO, you've got to know where the gatekeepers are in this new infrastructure. Because there's a presumption that, well, 20 years ago, you'd go through a few mainstream media and also Reuters and AP, and you'll get everything out, and you'll dominate the, the media sphere. But the extent to which gatekeepers, both in which they've, they've changed who they are, and the nature of gatekeeping is changing, um, people talk now about networked gatekeeping, where, you know, in the end we might all converge on the same story, but we, we go through many, many different social media sites or other media sites. Um, so, so this is something that uh, public diplomacy practitioners are trying to, to uh, grapple with. And obviously in different countries, the way in which 
you know, often still quite a narrow news agenda, you know, top five stories every day that most people are aware of. It's, it's still, you know, there are still mass audiences. Um, so we have to be slightly sceptical here. Now, in the Paul Edwards chapter, he talks about infrastructure being socio-technical. So obviously he's, you know, part of the actor network turn and all of that, and we, we must be socio-technical today. Um, but it's, it's useful to remember that infrastructure involves human organisation as well. So we, we need to look at how the institutions and organisation of media is changing and how the forms of knowledge about infrastructure is changing. Um, so I mean, I'll talk very briefly about, I mean, Marie Gillespie's coming in a couple of weeks, but I think her, her study of the BBC World Service is a really good example of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a strategic narrative outlet. It's a public diplomacy tool for the British government. But it's, it's having to adapt to this new infrastructure. Um, so what Marie concedes that she's got a, a new book out called Drama for Development, where she goes through how um, lots of different branches of the World Service target different audiences in different ways. And it, it's very interesting. Um, and she, she and the others talk about the BBC World Service as this, this contact zone between you have the BBC bosses and FCO bosses, and then the BBC writers who, and producers who produce the stuff, and then writers and producers in local countries, whether it's you know, Pakistan or, or Somalia or wherever, and then local audiences in Pakistan or wherever. Um, and that somehow there has to be this, the ideal from the FCO's point of view is to have this this narrative going, you know, reaching and changing the, they even talk about be, changing the behaviour of the audiences. It's quite prescriptive and behavioralist what the intention is. Um, but she finds that they, they've gone through various phases where they've had to adapt their infrastructure, <coughs> or they've had to adapt how they do this. So in the, in the beginning was the kind of archers model where, um, you know, after World War II in this country, BBC has the archers, there's a food shortage, we have a storyline about raising pigs. And the hero in the village gets to marry the girl, the, beauty, the beautiful girl in the village, because he's raised the pig. And this is, oh, if I, the audience, if they can raise pigs too, they'll be successful, and we have uh, a successful recovery from the war. So they, they, there's this kind of didactic, linear, behavioural change model that they started with. So with Afghanistan, post-2001, they basically, on Afghan radio, they had the same framework or storyline, but with sheep. Mm. <laughs> but, but coming through their project, and they've been studying this now, uh, they've really changed because they, they've realised they can't get away with that anymore. And um, they're, so they're looking at how, given that people in, in Afghanistan, for example, can contribute to the debate about some of the, the programming, and there are various feedback loops through global media now that it, it's not linear. Um, so now they're, they're kind of grappling with, in this new infrastructure, they've got to be both exact and playful. They've got to describe the country pretty well so it's authentic and seems rich and accurate to the people in the country. But they can't be too prescriptive about the kind of behaviour that they're encouraging. They've got to be... Um, creative and approximate and like uh, accept that they're not really going to have a direct influence over behaviour. So th I just think this is a really good example and you know when Marie comes you could maybe push her on this. Yes. Um, of, I, just to kind of conclude that example, I mean they, they talk about a focus on transnational circuits of cultural production, translation and consumption is necessary to avoid the sometimes limiting assumptions of public diplomacy aimed at changing audiences' behaviours. So, transnational circuits. So, we've got the infrastructure, and then within it we've got production, translation and consumption, <coughs> which is very similar to our um, strategic narrative framework of, of formation, projection, and then reception or consumption. Um, so, there, this is another project in this case, kind of the British public diplomacy effort through the war on terror and post-war on terror now, through which this strategic narrative framework is kind of being tested now and applied. 
uh, by practitioners. And it's very interesting, like the, the role of translation in this and who you get to do that and how you convince your bosses that you know, what they think Afghani need, people need isn't necessarily what's going to fly. And, um, so, but the final point I want to make on infrastructure. Is, is, yeah. is that directly Yeah. Yeah. Um, final point on infrastructure as well is that it's being contested. <clears throat> the nature of the internet, you cannot escape these debates. Just in the last month, we've had, oh, Twitter's going to censor certain things in certain countries. Although it's tell you, going to tell you exactly how to get around that. Uh, Facebook, IPO, and, and various uh, struggles with censorship and so on and so on. The, <clears throat> obviously, the, the information infrastructure, within that you do your communication. But if you can shape the nature of the infrastructure in the first place, then you would think it's easier to, to, to perform the kind of communication you want. So... We need to conceptualise information infrastructure both as this environment but also as embodying your strategic narrative. So Hillary Clinton and, and her team constantly talking about a, an open and free internet. That isn't just because then they could communicate better if there's an open and free internet. That is part of their strategic narrative about how the international system should be, open and free. So the, there's a kind of um, tension going on there. Um, you know, to, we were talking about this in, in the class with some students that uh, they were talking, well, us, our, is China's attempt to kind of control certain aspects of the internet within its country a way to say, actually, we need to have a, an, an international order where sovereignty is respected, and if we want to censor the internet, we will. It's our business. So in, in the way in which they're approaching the information infrastructure is, is doing their narrative work for them. So there's different relationships between information infrastructure and strategic narratives. You said about 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah. you've got 50. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the second one is, a uh, second problem that keeps coming up with uh, practitioners is when you come up with this great strategic narrative and you project it and then it goes and you're not in control of it anymore and it gets adjusted or challenged or say obviously this is very much from the mastery view of what policy making should be, you know, control of the message, um, which many practitioners still think in those, in those terms. So, I mean, a useful model that, that captures this, this tension is, is Brian McNair in his book Cultural Chaos uh, in 2006, where he talks about sort of two approaches to contemporary journalism and political order a kind of chaos paradigm and, a, and an order paradigm. Sorry, a control paradigm and a chaos paradigm. Um, so the control paradigm refers to the manner in which kind of big media organisations and other elites retain what he calls control of the cultural apparatuses of media. End quote. From which there are, quote, planned and predictable outcomes, end quote. So the linear model which is still prevalent in some organisations. And then he says, in contrast to this kind of economic determinism of the control model, a chaos paradigm assumes multi-causality. It stresses contingency at all phases of the communication process, including production, consumption, and social action. Um, so, so there's this kind of binary dichotomy between do you try to aspire to control over your, over your narrative, or do you just let it go free-floating? Um, and a, a good example of the letting it go was um, where President Ahmadinejad in 2006 put the, the open letter to President Bush, the, uh, the first attempt at kind of open diplomacy between the two countries since 1979. And... Um, where he posted a letter on the internet saying, Dear President Bush, this is my response to your latest kind of um, statements and maybe we can have a conversation about this. And by putting it on the internet for everybody to read and it was translated into different languages, he was kind of surrendering control of it. Because the whole world could have laughed at him or they could have thought, oh, yeah, some open diplomacy would be nice. Or The point is he, he couldn't control how the world responded to it. And... It, he was almost harnessing the unpredictability. 
because then that forced Bush onto the back foot, uh, who was used to having control over the communication with Iran, to suddenly have to respond in terms where everybody could see what the communication was. Everybody could read it, and they, everybody, whether it's on a Chinese chat room or whatever, could say, oh yeah, Bush, Bush should say this, because it's open, and unlike most traditional diplomacy. So there's this kind of, do you control or do you go with chaos, or are there new strategic possibilities for controlled chaos, or chaotic control, I don't know. But one of the, one of the things we've researched this in terms of is, um, is archives and memory, control over memory. So obviously memory is central to narratives because you want to have some kind of settled version of the past in order to narrate where, where we're coming from in order to where to go to the future. So in, in the book um, Diffused War, Andrew Hoskins and, write, uh, Andrew Hoskins and I write, uh, the relationship between media and memory is that whereas before forgetting was the norm, Remembering becomes the default condition. So in this digital information infrastructure, the tendency is towards it being very hard for things to get forgotten, which is slightly contentious. But in a kind of mobile recording cultures, we would expect there to be this kind of new proliferation of content which eventually settles down into archives which are searchable, retrievable. I mean, just the, the proliferation of content. Um, so this, this almost suggests order in McNair's terms. There, there will be loads and loads of content and we can't control who's producing it, but we know there will be this mass of content. So you could have a general strategy towards how we use the massive digital content around the world in order to narrate the past, present and future. Um, but the problem is how, it, how this, these archives are emerging is things like WikiLeaks shows that you know certain actors aren't in control of what's going public in the first place. So there is all there are all of these archives, but who controls them is is very difficult. Um, but one thing we've we've come across is, is a transition to ongoing memorialization of events. It used to be that with wars and conflicts, it would happen, and then afterwards you'd. Uh, you'd have some kind of retrospective, you'd have an anniversary that, around which you could formalise some memorialisation memorialization practices. But with the, the wars of the 21st century, what we've found is people memorialising stuff as it's happening. In some cases, even before it's happening, which I, I can talk about in questions if you want. Um, but because it's possible to, to create a, a website and create your own record of the Iraq war or, or any war, we find people doing this. Um, so there's the kind of state control of, of memories of war is, is being kind of challenged by this in, through this information infrastructure. Um, so one of them, there's one called IraqiMemorial.org, which seeks to commemorate civilian deaths since the beginning of the Iraq War in 2003. It says its aims are to honour and commemorate the deaths of thousands of civilians. Uh, secondly, um, to establish an internet archive as a living memorial. And thirdly, to mobilise international communities of artists to contribute proposals to find new ways to represent memory, unity and peace. So we've got these, you know, the idea of the living memorial, not the settled memorial. This seems to be something that has implications for all strategic narrative work, which we need to think through. Um, so all of this, yeah, this, this memorialisation, you know, it should, pre it's traditionally presented past and kind of sometimes ends with an imagined future, many exhibits and things like that, um, that enables you to kind of have perspective on past events and to look back with distance but that distance is collapsing if the memorial is living. So the opportunity, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping we'll, we'll be able to talk about this, but this kind of ongoing, it creates a certain openness of how the international system is being remembered and marked and by whom and, and so on and so on. Um, 
how, yeah, how national identity is constituted, how interests become articulated through, through these, these digital practices. Um, it's interesting, but at the same time, um, states are really trying to control the message. So I thought I'd give one, one way of, of talking about the attempts to maintain the control and not allow your strategic narrative to, to leak and leak out of, out of control is looking at the effectiveness measures that state departments use. Because that shows exactly where they're trying to trace their narrative, where they want it to go to, who the audiences are. And um, I mean, some of you might, might know a lot more than me about this, but we, we looked at a few of these. Um, so in, the, in Britain in 2008, the, the FCO and the British Council um, piloted a framework to measure the formation, projection, and reception of their strategic narrative. Uh, they didn't use the word strategic narrative. Um, and come up with some kind of reliable measurement practices so that when there's a big summit or big diplomatic catastrophe, they can measure how people in different parts of the world are, are looking at this. So what they, they measured three things. Um, Short-term media reporting over like three months. When you have a big, you know, Copenhagen climate summit or, or whatever, do you change journalists' coverage of your country? Secondly, do you change policy influences in the country that you're targeting? So, i.e., I don't know, think tank staff, diplomats, key public intellectuals, like gatekeepers, intermediaries, if you like. And then thirdly, do you change policy through your strategic narrative? Um, do you find behavioural change in a country's public policy in keeping with what you would like them to be doing in terms of maybe their, do you want them to form regional alliances or alliances with you or, or some, some aspect of their foreign policy. So around a climate change event um, in which the UK government was promoting a particular narrative, um, what they found was that in the reports on the internet, they found that lots of media coverage of, of their narrative, uh, more awareness of the issue of climate change among policy influencers, influencers, sorry, slightly, I don't like that word, um, and in the long term, signs of public behavioural change regarding carbon footprints in the countries where they were targeting their narrative. But the problem with this is that there are loads of other reasons why people in those countries might have been changing their carbon footprints, or why, you know, public intellectuals were saying roughly what the British government might have wanted them to say. So to, to discerning identifiable kind of causal impacts on reception, they, they ran into a bit of a brick wall with that project, but I'm sure they've tried new things since. In 2010, the US uh, State Department um, had the, developed their framework for evaluating their public diplomacy um, called the Public Diplomacy Model for the Assessment of Performance. And they, this assessment of performance study aimed to evaluate the impact of uh, US electronic media outreach in, in various countries. And they were trying to show that public diplomacy could be cheap and very kind of cost effective. It could have discernible, identifiable, identifiable, identifiable impacts that you could go back to Hillary Clinton and say, yes, give us more money to do more of this. Um, so they, they were trying to find out, firstly, what what effects does US public diplomacy have on their on foreign publics? And to do this, they did this um, social media link analysis to see who was sending information to who, who was linking to who, were people linking to the State Department people? And then they did um, sentiment analysis of people's kind of postings on social media uh, using local linguistic experts. So the, the, it was fairly nuanced. And what they found was that um, Russians did pay quite a lot of attention to US media, and um, including some US public diplomacy stuff. But it's because they, they were fascinated by America, because it was different and it's important. And it wasn't really anything to do with American public diplomacy. It was Russians, at the time they were doing that study, there was a, a, an election going on, 
and they wanted to look at how elections were being done in, in America to compare to how they were being done in, in Russia. Um, whereas Indonesians were linking to um, you know, all of the foreign policy people um, and consuming American media because it had a kind of celebrity status to them and it, it was, had this glitz. Um, and then they sampled Urdu Pakistanis. They were really interested to see how people in Pakistan were responding to their public diplomacy. But then they found out that everybody that they analysed were actually living in London. Um, so their assumptions about where online communities are were, were slightly misguided. Um, so again, that kind of ran into various brick walls. Um, but they, they then did extra things. They, they must have had a fair bit of money because they, they then commissioned in-country focus groups. They did analysis of the local media infrastructures um, and they interviewed their local embassies. And, and overall they found that the people weren't using new media to discuss geopolitics much. That, um, so, but this, I mean we can go into detail with these kind of studies, but they're so short term. And strategic narratives, we would suggest, are, are probably quite long-term things before you can discern any identifiable impact. The, the, the public diplomats are looking for kind of short-term bursts of response or behavioural change which can, which can justify further spending on this. Um, so how, you know, I'm sure you might have people from developing countries asking for how can we do effective strategic narrative work? And looking at the, the, some of the pitfalls of the methodologies that, that Britain and America have used might be quite instructive, I think. Um, I mean, we do this research ourselves as, as researchers. You know, we might do ethnography or in-country focus groups or, or whatever, or social media analysis. So it's interesting to see that the public diplomats are doing, doing the same thing. Finally, um, the question of creating experience, creating the right experience. If... You know, if you read your Paul Ricoeur and, uh, and other people totter off on narrative, they talk about narrative as a phenomenological thing. It's about creating, you know, your sense of where you are in the world and where things are going. Um, so strategic narrative, by implication, would be about how you get people to sense that they're part of the world system as you depict it, and that that system's are moving in a certain direction, and you're living that, you know, the... Uh, I don't know, people in 1945, did they feel, oh, we're on the verge of moving towards a Bretton Woods type Pax Americana, um, and will we enjoy that as we go through it? It's kind of buying into that experience. And on, on this, it's really interesting, um, John Eikenberry, the kind of IR IPE scholar, has just got a new book out called Liberal Leviathan, where he talks about the kind of American narrative post-1945 of their liberal world order, and he's, he's saying that something interesting is happening, that uh, East Asia in particular are now running with the, the liberal interdependence view of the world, um, and America isn't the one pushing this narrative anymore. It's got to the stage now where through ASEAN or other kind of forms of institutionalisation that, that the, the American strategic narrative is now just, it doesn't need America anymore. It's others are, are, just, are just taking it as, as given which, um, I don't know, but, but this, is, this is classic IR that doesn't look at how the communication processes are playing, are playing out here. And I, I'm sure if you talk to people in East Asia or whatever, they might, they might be institutionalising things as you know, their trade or their security arrangements in a way that might be in keeping with the kind of... Um, uh, liberal model, but do they understand themselves in the world in those terms, or do they understand themselves through their own kind of national or historical prisms? So, so there's this tension going on now within kind of American IR and, and kind of liberalism and realism in particular about what happens when you know is it uh, this is great because from your kind of American realist point of view, you've got countries pursuing interests that are. are pursuing behaviour that is in your interests, but you don't even have to do your public diplomacy anymore. Now, whether this is true, I don't know, but I just want to throw that out for debate as an example where you can have a narrative being taking hold in a part of the world, 
without people experiencing the world in terms of that narrative. I haven't really seen an example of this before, but this is what kind of what Eikenberry is, is depicting as happening. Um, so he, he writes in a discussion afterwards, uh, ex an exchange with Stephen Walt, he says, I do think that the United States has spearheaded a liberal accomplishment. Within the parameters of the post-war American-led system, uh, progressive upgrades in world politics occurred. The world economy was opened up, the golden era of trade and growth followed, Germany and Japan were integrated into a collaborative world order, France and Germany found a way to live together, a whole range of developing states in East Asia, Eastern and Southern Europe and Latin America grew, developed and made democratic transitions. These accomplishments flow from the character of the order. It's an order where the spoils of modernity have been widely shared. It's an order that is easy to join and hard to overturn. So he say, I, I think I mean, it's a very bold argument, really. Um, and whether, you know, is that true? And if it, if it was true, are there other examples, maybe locally or regionally, where countries are running with narratives that maybe don't resonate, but you find the behavioural change you would expect? Um, from those promoting the narratives in the first place. Um, but is it an, is it an empty victory? Uh, this is kind of a lurking in Eikenberry's argument. Is it an empty victory if China or Singapore are performing the American uh, liberal accomplishment without believing in it? So, in conclusion, then, what I've tried to do today is kind of, first of all, set out this conceptualisation of what strategic narratives are, where we're coming from with this research agenda, and then there, there are many, many problems that we've run into when we've, we've explored this in the last couple of years, but I've presented three of these today. The, the, what happens when the information infrastructure is changing? Uh, how does this alter the temporality of narrative work and, and the structuring of past, present, future? Um, Secondly, the, the, the question of the intention behind the narrative. Public diplomacy experts are, are trying to, they've got intentions of what they want to project and they'd like people to buy into it. But there's, you know, problems of communication there and how you measure that. And then um, finally, the, the, the kind of related goal of trying to use strategic narrative to create shared experience and shared sense of international politics. What happens when that, um, when that shared experience might be missing, but rhetorically and institutionally, it looks as though it should be there. So I'll throw it over to, to you for some answers, hopefully, to those problems. Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much.